And we're back. Welcome to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I'm your host, John Dayton. Joining me today via Skype from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Is it Brooklyn? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, baby. Uh, I got Matt Dacey. He was here in the flesh last week. Now he's coming in online. Uh, Matt is my former roommate from about, I don't know, 150 years ago. Uh, we went to the same program at the same college together. St old. Studied theatrical <laughs> lighting design together. Um, and... Uh, Matt is on because, well, for one, uh, I hardly ever get a chance to talk to this guy. And for two, he sat in on the, the sound podcast last week, and we just had a hoot. So I decided to have him back. Uh, it also didn't hurt that nobody else on the panel was available tonight. So I, I was kind of strapped. Matt <laughs> Matt stepped up and decided to fill in. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce him just a little bit better. We kind of glossed over stuff uh, last week. But, um, Matt, who is it that you're working for right now? I uh, called the Lansky Group. It's uh – a manufacturer's representative for about uh, 30 different manufacturers uh, in New York City and Long Island and around here. Uh, basically a move that I made. I was in design for the last 10 years in architectural design. And before that, I was in theater design and, you know, entertainment design and stuff like that where we came out of school. Uh, and so this is more of a representation sales position, but I still... Uh, get to create with it. And what's great about it is it's a real bridge between uh, the entertainment community. So I, I work with a lot of guys like ETC and all local point and stuff like that. And then I'll also uh, hit up a lot of the architectural guys. So I get to speak uh, dork in two dialects. It's great. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. Well, anyway, the reason uh, that we're here is um – I'm just about to embark on uh, about a six-month-long process. Uh, my church is going to make a, a movie for Christmas instead of doing a big drama production. Uh, last year we made this movie. Uh, you can read about it on the blog if you click uh, if you go to the topics link and click on Project Movie. Um, I've already got a couple of posts up there about what we did last year. There's a link to the uh, the DVD that's actually up on Vimeo now. You can watch the whole thing uh, in HD online. Um, anyway, I, I won't get into the the who, what, where, why, and how, but at any rate, we're starting up this year, and so uh, tomorrow, actually, the day after we record this, which will be, I don't know, six days ago by the time this goes to air, uh, let's do the time warp, sorry, sorry, <laughs> keeping it professional, it's a family show, um, to jump. <laughs> jump to the left, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm probably going to not be able to control myself, and, and I'm going to call back a lot of jokes from when we shared a room, um, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, tomorrow we're going in, and my boss uh, wrote the story. He's going to show us some material. He has some. Uh, he hasn't even told me what. So I don't know if we're going to wa we're going to watch something. We're going to watch a movie or a TV show or something that's kind of got the flavor of what he wants to do, and then we're going to go off of that and build our concepts for what we're going to do. And that's um, this is what I want to get into was the concept. When we were in design technology, learning how to light theater. Uh, the first class we took was design fundamentals. It was actually the very first class we took. Um, but uh, first, probably you know that, the most intense. Oh my goodness, was it intense? It was, uh, as we said last week, they they trained you up for professional life by trying to kill you. And uh, so yeah, the first words I heard as a, a freshman starting the program were, "Look to your left and your right. Those two people probably won't be here when you graduate." Uh, and of course, you know, implied was maybe you won't be here when they graduate. Uh, but just a super, super education in, oddly enough, design fundamentals. Um, and they taught us – it was really visually oriented because uh, they were teaching lighting designers, costume designers, set designers, um, and even the, the tech directors and the stage managers had to, had to sit in on this, so they kind of got it. Um, when I transferred after three years in that department studying lighting and all the other stuff we had to study, I went to the music department and uh, – you know, the sound was really my thing. It was really easy for me, and it was awesome because it was a really easy jump to take all the stuff that Mike Cesario – I was going to say God rest him, but he's not dead. <laughs> what do you no, say? he's certainly not. He's very much alive. <laughs> I don't know what you say about a guy when he's when he's still alive, but God bless him, I hope. Um, you know, gave us this, this kick-butt education in how to – how to get right to the heart of something and, and come up with a design that embodies it and shapes it and molds it and and – the way that they did that was um, through obviously a bunch of training in the visual arts, drawing, painting, sketching. Um, but we also did this thing called a concept, the dreaded concept. And there was one, there was at least one due every week. And uh, by the time you actually got into taking some courses in your major, uh, they were fewer and farther between, but they were even more of a big deal. And I'll just I'll kind of outline it real quickly, and then I'm gonna uh, let Matt see if he remembers anything that I don't. What it was was uh, 
in our case, we would be, you know, reading a play. And so you read the play and before you say, all right, you know, I'm going to, you know, before you get out the swatch book and start picking out gels and fixtures and stuff, um, you really got to get an idea of where you're going. And, you know, you might say, okay, you know, I'm the wonder kid. I just, I get it. I know what I want to do. But even if you were that good and you immediately got a perfected vision for what you wanted to do for a show, you needed to be able to explain that to other people and make yours your ideas match up with most importantly what the director wanted, but also how to tie in if you're a lighting guy, uh, what you're doing with what the costumers are doing, what the sets are doing, and the painters and all that stuff. So the way they did it was you wrote this concept. And it was three paragraphs, very simple, and really the shorter the better, because um, you wanted to be able to take that and it was like a tool. You didn't you didn't really need this big, you know, ornate baroque structure. You just, you needed the guts of what you were going to do. And so the first paragraph was the concept, the second paragraph was the image, and the third paragraph was the implementation. And <clears throat> what they basically meant was, like, the concept would be, like, you know, all right, you know, what does this play mean to me? And then, you know, so you would talk about maybe the, you know, psychological or socioeconomic or, you know, whatever it is, whatever the gist of the play was. You know, is it an angry play? Is it, you know, uh, a, a smart, talky play? Is it, is it comedic? Uh, so all those things. So you, you kind of try and just summarize things. I think I got that right, right? Uh, I think you nailed it. And okay. the great thing about it is you had to get everything in one page. You would you would get if you had more than one page. The whole idea was it's kind of like uh, the salesman's elevator speech. If you can't get it done in 30 seconds to a minute, you can't get it done. Exactly, and it, it was uh, the, the Skype connection cut out there a little bit. You had, you actually got docked points. Um, in fact, it was it was pretty much not permissible. If you showed up with more than a page, they showed you the door. Quite literally, there it is. You go stand in the hall. Um, so your your first paragraph boils down to the essence of the play. Your second paragraph, and this is where things start to get interesting, is you come up with usually a visual image for what the the show is about and the classic one the one that they gave you as a freebie on the on opening day and you weren't allowed to use under any circumstances was a rose blooming through ice and what was the show it was it was originally dreamed up for was it streetcar I, it was some tennessee williams or cat in the hot it was, tin it, roof or something it, 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 i think it was cat in the hot tin roof because okay. yeah, that's the one that we had to read coming in right so you into the, school so that's like, so how we translate this into that comes a little bit later, but let me let me kind of give it to you. So in in I think it was cat on a hot tin roof. Let's let's just say that it was. All right. So you have a rose frozen in a block of ice. Think about that in terms of color. Whether you're a costume designer, set designer, lighting designer, maybe you're all working off the same concept here. So you've got it's cold, it's frigid, uh, it's maybe bright and shiny and reflective. And then as the ice starts to melt, the rose starts to bloom, maybe layers of costume come away and reveal some warmer color underneath. Maybe the lights shift from steel blue into some warmer colors and eventually get very warm. So you, you kind of get the idea here. Maybe the set pieces are shifting a little bit. Um, you know, maybe the, maybe just the paint's a different color in the second act. Um, but anyway, you, you got this image, and we'll uh, we can kick around a few different ideas. Um, and we'll, actually, when we get to talking about how Matt and I have gone on to use this very uh, structure in our professional lives, <laughs> like, I've got some actually some pretty funny stories about how it came up. And then you get to finally the implementation. In the third paragraph, you're going to talk about how you're going to do this, which is sort of what I what I just semi-explained and explaining what the image was. All right, I'm a lighting guy. I'm going to start with steel blue. That's going to be the ice. There's going to be just a little bit of warm coming in on the face. And then as things start to heat up, that, that face light's going to warm up and, and get hotter and hotter. And then I'm going to start bringing in, like, reds and oranges in the downlight. And until at the end, we're cooking them in a barbecue. There's no blue anywhere to be seen. It's all just hot, hot, hot. And, you know, and that's going to track along with the emotions that the actors are creating and hopefully also tie in with what the costume designer is doing, what the set designer is doing, and we'll make a day of it. And actually, i got to tell a story right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. When I uh, – after I had gotten set up, you know, where I moved back home after college, I, I bought a house, uh, got set up with a, a studio out in the garage. The first band that I had in to record, I was like, all right, guys, we need to come up with a concept for this, something to kind of tie all the songs together. So – you know, you guys are a heavy band. Just get together, talk a little bit amongst yourselves. I know it's going to be a stretch, but I want you to come up with a, a visual idea that we're going to then translate into how what we do for the sounds. Like, do you want like a very hard edge thing? You know, like like flint, or does it want to be industrial? You know, like metal pounding on metal, or you know, does it want to be like electricity, kind of crackly and and you know whatever? So like, all right, talk amongst yourselves, figure it out. They called me back two days later and they were like, 
uh, dude, we just want to sound like Godsmack, okay? So I was like, I, <laughs> well, at least that's something. Um, and so I kind of took that. I was like, all right, well, Godsmack's angry. So, you know, I, I so tried you to... called Sully, and you were asking what his concept of the whole thing was. And <laughs> yeah. There you go. But that at least gave me something like, all right, they want to be angry. They want it to be pounding. I, I said in that uh, they actually had a pretty diverse lineup of songs, like some were chargers, some were kind of slow burners. And so it really did need something to tie it together. And uh, well, anyway, that's um, – that was actually kind of where I want to go with this next, but I don't, I don't want to leave uh, Design Tech just yet. Um, have you got any good memories or, or anything to add about uh, sitting in, sitting there with Mike Cesario, uh, learning all this stuff? Well, I think for the most part, it the the way that it progressed through the three years is that you ended up going from your own concepts to being the supporter of other concepts. So. Uh, and I think the people that didn't succeed were the ones that really didn't get that, that you're not the star. And the truth is, uh, both sound and light, you're not the star. We'll be honest about that. Like I said last week, we're the glue. But you got to know if you're crazy glue or if you're gorilla glue. <laughs> so, um, and that is the one that really is translated into the rest of my life is that, you know, Learning what your own concept is, is great. And having a point of view to go in with vital because you're going to have to argue it, you know, and you're going to have to at least come from somewhere or you can't even discuss where you're going. Um, but what you really learn down the line is supporting other points of view. And especially when they're, when they're absolutely bat guano insane. <laughs> and that, that is a, uh, that's theater in a nutshell. It's people with uh, – you have directors and sometimes producers with just ideas that don't make a half a lot of sense. And, you know, both Sound and Light have the great advantage of, you know, your stuff shows up late. So for the most part, you're really just involved in discussion and uh, progressing concept along. And so – what I've always said is the, the great item designers are the ones that crack the first joke. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you're that, uh, you're a good team player and you can understand where this crazy person is going and lead them on a path to something that other people will understand, you've done your job. And then, you know, then you do your thing off of that. And, and that, that's really how that has, uh, evolved into real life uh but for mike i think uh what i remember the most about that guy is that he would have you heart-wrenching and crying almost one minute and then he's yelling his face off at you you know within the next 30 seconds it was an absolute emotional ride three hours three hours every week and you just leave and you just kind of shake your head. But, you know, you went through an experience. And at the end of the whole thing, you were – I'll tell you what I really remember. Um, he brought in uh, some, a couple of juniors, lighting designers. We were going through some of our own work. And, uh, you know, they just nailed exactly what we were doing to a person within, like, a sentence. And it was just an amazing – display of oh this is where we're supposed to get to do you remember that at all yeah it was he, mike think, mike was reading off our concepts and and the juniors were like oh yeah that's, that was ej's yeah i i think it was uh was it Kaufman was it or? oedipus or electra or something like oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we were doing electra and uh yeah so the junior lighting designers came in and we i think it was sean Kaufman, sean gallagher yep they came in and they just went pop 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 right down the line and just nailed everybody with what they were doing, what was weak, what was strong, and then out. And it was, it was, that was a real moment knowing that, like, okay, so two years from now, I'm going to be that sharp. We're going to be Jedis. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know what? I think um, the way Mike treated us in class, you know, that, that was, that really goes a long way towards illustrating things. I don't think to this day, having worked for you know everybody for just like people who are insane on cocaine and sleazy promoters and it just 
all manner of nutty people. None of it was as intense as getting my work reviewed by Mike Cesario. I mean, you were just right. Like, mm -hmm. He would scream at you. Like, he would say something, like, really poignant and then scream at you and then make you laugh and then do it again and then do it to the next kid. I mean, he would just – he must have had to sleep for two days after he did those classics. He, it had to be exhausting. But it was perfect training because, like, nothing yet has been that intense in my life. And you know what? That's everybody that taught in that school, you know, anything that – Dan Hanessian would do technically, you know, and th this is a guy who uh, I I now consider, you know, a colleague and uh, very friendly. But this guy was a bastard and we paid him to be one. He stated as much I mean, on opening this guy, day. Yeah. Oh, and you knew exactly what was coming, but th you would just get your soul crushed for four straight years by this man. And then once you're done, it's like, you know, he hands you a beer and he's like, okay, everything's good. Have fun. <laughs> and then he's on your side. Yeah. Yeah, that was what was shocking to me a couple years down the line, like going to weddings, you know, people's weddings from school and seeing him on the guest list. I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sit at a table with him. They're like, oh, no, it's cool. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. There was uh, just another level of the intensity. So moving on. Um, yeah, th actually <laughs> – Sorry, I want to back up just a second. It was really cool, and I never really thought about it. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, how, like, the seniors, you know, last last time around I said how, you know, the, the seniors weren't complaining about their work. They just ha either had it done or were about to get it done. And that was what was – I remember that being really terrifying as a freshman to go, like, okay, you know, I'm looking at this this icon of the business, this great, you know – designer and of course they're super intense but then he just brought in a couple of guys that were only two years older than us who were already almost that good and that was really mind-blowing if so, anything it taught you to streamline your try, streamline your mind and quick yeah yeah so moving on um we eventually took that learning that we had went out into other places oh i remember what i was going to do i was i was I, I wanted to linger in dt for a second because um what you said about uh, being a subordinate, really, uh, ultimately to the director or the producer, but also really to the other designers. Because uh, like you say, we're the intangible medium. Um, and so like what the people who are working in, you know, the cold hard facts, the costumers, the uh, set designers, the painters, choreographers, that sort of thing, is we, just, we really need to support them and make what they're doing better. And maybe if you're lucky, you get to collaborate at the beginning and kind of really agree on something. But more often than not, they they really get to put their vision out there first, and then we just have to, to meet up with that. And I remember um, I, I've been thinking about this ever since Oh Brother, We're Out There come out, came out. And you look at you know the whole movie's tobacco-colored, and it took me back instantly. Do you remember um, our buddy Jerome Martin – came up with he was designing sets for i forget what show but like that was kind of his concept like it was oh was it um grapes of wrath it was all sepia tones yeah I mean, and he even he mm. went to the point you know like all his sketches were done i mean it looked like he did him an octopus ink or something just like the the darkest color was like you know a fine pair of italian shoes it was all just browns and tans and and sand and and all these natural tones like whatever the show was like it, it really called for something dry dried out and, and dusty and he even found a place that would when it was time for him to make his blueprints would make sapia tone blueprints so and all the you know his sketches were sapia tone i think he printed his like all his printed material was done in brown ink his his documents his drawings were all brown it was ridiculous looking at this stuff like he went into that level of detail he didn't just say you know oh you know we're gonna do this and it's gonna be dry and sandy like he just it was baked in to every aspect of his work on that show that's still just one of the coolest things i've ever ever seen in the design world well yeah he's a special cat and i actually just ran into him a couple of weeks ago and uh just still wicked smart wicked conceptual uh and you know i mean he's basically a permanent broadway assistant right now but he definitely still gets his point across he's uh he's a special guy and he was he was the kind of guy that maybe said four words all year, but man, did he just have visual chops! Like you know, he'd, he'd never say anything, but when he did, it was mind numbing. And then just to look at his work, I mean, he could make four four strokes with a pencil on a piece of paper and and just make you understand something. And uh, it was actually looking at his work as a freshman, like he was already a really well developed uh, visual artist in terms of like sketching and painting. And uh, that was one of the things that really drove me to. I'm still not 
not very good at it at all, but to instead of, you know, if I'm going to draw a building with a tree and some grass, I mean, he, you know, just be like, scratch, 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 there's a building, swish, 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 here's a tree, scritchy, scritchy, there's some grass. And just that fast could make you understand the scene that was in his head. And I would, for me to do it, like, I grew up, I was a carpenter's son. Like, I went, like, okay, the building's going to be this tall, and there's going to be bricks here and a window here. Uh-oh. Somebody else is calling me on Skype now. Hang on a second. Well, that was bummer. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that you? Three, two, one. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Wait, did you drop out and just come back? Or? I might have just dropped out, and I tried calling you back and stuff like that. I I may have just lost network, but I'm sitting right next to my router, so I don't even know how that would work. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I was just, I was just yapping away about uh, refining your skill as a, a visual artist. I don't know if you caught that part or not, but <laughs> excuse me. Um, like my tendency would to make this, <laughs> these really complex drawings – and, you know, drum would just go scratch, 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 and you could see this whole scene. And it was, like, really sloppy and really cool looking and, and really simple. And, and that's what I've, to this day, still strive for in all my work is to, um, I unfortunately still have to do things kind of complicated and then pick out everything that's not necessary. I, I haven't even yet, you know, more than a decade later gotten to where I can just, like, boom, there's the simple thing right on the page, and we're working from that. Um, if you remember, uh, in Design Fundamentals, we were doing Antigone. And his imagery was a picture of a crying baby on a pink background. Yes. And that was it. <laughs> and he nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> so he unveiled that, and we were all like, fuck. What the you heck? You did it. And, and we're like, oh, man, he's going to get ripped apart. And then doesn't Mike Cesario come over and go, genius, right here? He was <laughs> like, what? And then two years later, you figure out why it's genius, and it's absolutely correct. I'm still not sure I know why. I just know that it is. I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of – Because it's, it's 100% emotional. There's nothing uh, – there's nothing else binding it, you know. There's no, you know, there's no backstory or anything like that. It's just the feeling of the crying baby on the page is the feeling that he has for that show. True. Yeah. So Straight that was up. Like the ultimate, one for one. That was like the ultimate as a set designer, ultimate implementation of a concept. And really, if you think, picture that. Like you go to see Antigone. All right, some classic theater. You know, the high art of years gone by. And you show up, and there's some avant-garde designer. Curtain opens. There's a 40 foot wide, 30 foot high picture of a crying baby on a bright pink background. And I think I remember like Mike picked up like some notebooks and was cropping it. He's like, so yeah, maybe you know you fly in a leg here and a, a border here, and you just see the eye for starts. And then in this scene, you expand it a little bit. And so he made it all about revealing this face. But think about that. Like you're sitting in a theater and you're looking at that, and really. It almost asks more questions than it's like it. It doesn't give you the answers. Like that's what we were doing at first was we would come up with these very literal concepts and images that would try and lay it all out for you. Like this is exactly what this is, and this is why I'm doing this. And it was really transparent. But you know, we were only ten minutes out of high school, and the the kids that really got it were the ones that figured out how to how to do something that was evocative of what they were feeling, but wasn't just like oh, what a giveaway. There it is. Like you know, they would. It, right. It, and it didn't yet it didn't make you work to figure out what they were trying to say, but it just it kept you thinking. It made you want to know why why was this like this? It wasn't just cool for the sake of cool or whatever. Well, I mean, we may be just victims of uh the art that has been around us because of that. We we're used to television and movies that have to wrap it up at the end, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how it's been since the basically since Jaws. But anything before then, you left an open-ended question, and it's okay to do that. Right. You know? You could have Rocky, you know, and he loses the fight. And Apollo says there'll be no rematch, but you don't know that. You have uh, the original Italian job where you have everybody hanging off of one of the Alps in a bus, and it's just dangling, and there's a big helicopter shot in the end, and that's it. Right. And you're like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Are they going to die? Are they going to be okay? Didn't matter. So there was something to be said about leaving more open questions and not having to, like, coddle to, you know, the least common denominator. And once we – I think once we learned that, it was actually kind of liberating where, like, you could actually let your audience think. 
Indeed. And actually, that's what to this day makes me so angry about like the latest brand of, of scum rock that's out there. Pay attention, all you songwriters listening to this, both of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the, it's no, nobody listens to this yet. Um, but like Nickelback and, and other bands like that that are just, you know, like, yeah, beer, barbecue, redneck, we're cool. Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it's a great show. And it's, you know, it's big, big rock and roll. But um they don't leave anything to the imagination. It's, I mean, like you write a song where the hook line is, "I like your pants around your feet." Like, where's yeah. that? Where's, where's that my new? <laughs> where's my new dark side of the moon? Yeah, and fortunately, I mean, there's there's lots of other artists there that are a lot more subtle. Like even in the pop market, they're a little more subtle than that. That like would would say something and make you think a little bit about what it means, and like maybe you get it or maybe you don't. I mean, like you look back to, um, you know, like Nirvana was still real big when we were in school. Like we can plant a house, we can build a tree. What the heck does that mean? Like, is it just nonsense or does it mean something to to other people? Like, and uh, that's the that's what art should do. Art should show you something and give you something, and then make you keep thinking after that. So keep that in mind. Actually. The 90s were kind of special with that, you know? I mean, uh, that and, you know, Tarantino films and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Like, you you were given a framework, and you were allowed to kind of fill in the gaps. Maybe a, a six-year period of time. Uh, and then 2000 came, and that went away. But, uh, you know, for a, a nice run, you know, people were allowed to be... Uh, intelligent about their entertainment it it, it was really a special time and i guess we now we sound like old men talking about this but uh and maybe it was just you know we were under this influence at this time with this stuff appearing but maybe we were just lucky that that was happening at the same time that we were learning it it was a good time for it to be happening like as miserable as grunge was i was really kind of ticked off that that all came along because i was a big metalhead but you're right. Being subje- subjected to it while I was in the middle of getting all this training. Um, uh, that's one thing, actually, that was kind of interesting. I mean, this ties in on the audio side for you audio audio nerds still listening. Um, I don't listen to a ton of music, which people sometimes think is weird for a sound guy. But um, ask a songwriter how much how much music they listen to recreationally. The answer is probably zero, because when you're trained in something, you know, like Matt can't walk down the street probably without identifying every lighting fixture that he sees. I can't hear a song without picking apart the mix. My boss, who's a songwriter, can't hear a song without analyzing the melody and the chord structure. So um, w- we listen to a lot of stuff, but we don't. Not really. I mean, and so what's fun for me is to force myself to listen to stuff. I'll, you know, I'll sit in the doctor's office and listen to you know whatever hits from the seventies, but sit there and really listen to them, and and um, you know, just it, and and listen to stuff that I wouldn't normally listen to, even on my own iPod. Like I don't have that much music on my iPod. It's all really carefully handpicked, but there's still some stuff that I just don't li- ever listen to all the way through. And sometimes I'll just force myself or I'll put on Pandora and I'll force myself to, to I'll say, all right, I'm, I'm not going to hit the skip button for the next five songs. I'm just going to listen to everything that comes down and just digest it. And I can't remember why I got started on this idea. It's getting kind of late, but you, you know what I'm talking about? No, exactly. I mean, uh, I, I have trouble with uh, TV and movies, just watching it cin- cinematography. You know, I mean, the, the the Oh Brother thing is a perfect example. But there's shows that will do that. You know, there's some cheesy show that my wife watches, Hearts of Dixie or something like some crap like that. I don't know what it is. But there's always an amber filter on there. And that's stuff that I pick out. And I'm like, why am I paying attention to this? Well, because it's a crappy show. But the other reason why is because it's kind of my job. And uh, when it becomes your job, it's just a different – I don't know if it's a different part of your brain or if you're not – I can't say you're not doing it with your heart because you are. But uh, maybe it's with a more – maybe it's an, with an older heart. You know, It's not new love anymore. It's marriage. Ooh, that's gold, man. And yeah, actually, what uh, coming out of that idea is when you, what gets it for me is like, oh, brother, for me, it was the first movie in a long time that my disbelief was completely suspended. Um, people who work in theater and uh, and movies talk about this all the time. Suspension of disbelief. That's when you're not thinking about the curtains and the lights and the chair you're sitting at. It's when you're totally drawn into the story. So, like, Or if you're home watching a movie, it's you're not trying to figure out, like, well, was that a real explosion or was that CG? Or um, 
and still like as as poor relatively speaking as like star wars is you know it's guys in rubber suits and it's cartoons drawn in and stuff like that but it's somehow even with the state of the medium at the time george lucas managed to totally draw you in and believe everything that we're seeing and uh, uh-huh. Oh Brother was the first thing that had come along since then where I didn't think a bit about the tech. Now, maybe I did afterward, but you know, while I was watching it, totally drawn in, totally absorbed by it. And um, like even in the little uh, community theater things I work on now, uh, there's almost always at least one moment in the show where there's a couple of really good actors on stage. It's usually in the middle of Act 2 where all that, that touchy-feely stuff goes on, the, you know, the uh, pulling at your heartstrings, whatnots, before the comic relief comes back out, where I... Even as as a tech, as a guy getting paid to pay attention and, and manage the tech of the show, I get totally drawn in, and I have to like make sure that I draw myself back out of it because I suddenly totally believe that these aren't like these two actors who are the kids up the street; that they are these people who they're pretending to be, and there's real strife and drama and emotion between them. And um, and that's what the the signal of good art is: is when even if you're in the biz, if you don't think and don't wonder a bit how they did it, you're just totally drawn into the the human element of the story. I'm not sure if I lost him again. <laughs> Dark on it. Uh, that'll be an edit. <clears throat> yep, connecting. Ended. Awesome. All right, we're back, and it's the time warp again. It's now a week later uh, between Skype not working suddenly and schedules and messing around. Um, we actually coordinated things pretty well. I had uh, Matt all lined up again, even though the Mets were playing the Red Sox tonight. Or no, Mets and Yankees. I don't even know. I don't know if about it. a team we like and a team we hate are playing tonight. So he's rooted to that. And he was still going to jump on Skype and talk to us, but we couldn't get Skype to work. So uh, at any rate, it's a week later. I've got Carl Maciag in the house. He is back from another weekend warrior type mini tour, which you, if you uh, read the blog last week, heard about all of his adventures. And uh, we're going to kind of pick it up where we left off. You want to do a, a quick, uh, quick tour wrap up or should we just dive into it? Um, I can make it very quick uh our bus died the end we, we left it there <laughs> uh we have a great second home second family in the new holland area that helped us out big time and then uh some good people from home including my mother who we've uh i think we is it can cantonized canonized canonized for sainthood yeah for yeah. sainthood uh she she also came with the family minivan to cart half of us home. So, uh, um, you know, the shows were, like, awesome that we did get to play. But, um, you know, it was just getting there and back. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, sucked. <laughs> and one was canceled by, what, tornadoes? Tornado warnings, mm. which when our bus broke down, that caught up to us. So, um not only were we stuck, but we were stuck in the rain, too. So, it, you know, it was just, uh, you know, when it rains, it pours. Pretty much. Ching. All right. So, anyway, where we're at, uh, while, while we were hoping to still have Matt for a guest, uh, I had Carl go back and review everything that we said last week. And we were, it's unfortunate because we were just about to start where uh, we really hit the groove and Matt was really starting to spit gold about uh, the whole concept process. Uh, so anyway, Carl went through and listened to that stuff and, and kind of got to a point where he can talk a little bit about how he has used that stuff uh, in his work right here uh, at the church where I now work. So uh, um, we got the pump prime. I'm going to turn it over to him and, and let him talk a little bit about uh, how he has conceptualized a couple of different events here. Yeah, the the, the whole um, concept of having the concept is not something I've you know had a lot of um, experience with, um, you know, mostly I've just been a, an audio provider and, you know, especially in the, in the theater setting, you know, I'm just the, the audio operator, not necessarily audio designer. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, by the time I got in there, it would be too late in the game. So, um, when I was in the position that John is in now, um, we had, uh, annual, you know, uh, theater events, you know, whether it was Christmas time or, VBS productions here at one point were quite large. And, um, I can recall my, my first year, um, it was, um, you know, just, Oh, okay. Yeah. VBS is coming and you'll be doing the sound and lights for it. And, uh, you know, that's it. So, you know, not knowing what that all entailed and, 
you know, maybe what the expectations were. Um, I was not really in the game that much, uh, as I probably should have been and just, you know, let the, you know, the show director and producer and the people that who had been doing it for years, just kind of run with it. And all right, you know, just, I kind of approach it as, um, a service provider would, you know, let me know what you need and we'll make it happen. And, uh, that, that came to bite me big time, uh, on that one. Um, because, you know, by the time we really got down to the nuts and bolts, it was, um, pretty late in the game and I didn't, I really didn't have a grasp on what uh, the concept was for anything as far as uh, what the, the people putting on the show uh, had in mind. And that, you know, really made things um, very difficult to, you know, A, realize the the ideas and the goals that they had. But um, B, uh, because we were under the gun, it made it, you know, even more so difficult to uh, communicate, you know, it just got to the point where, all right, well, look, we, we're just, we're just going to get something going here and we're just going to have to roll with it. So, you know, the next year when that event came around again, um, I made sure that I was in a lot earlier in the game and helped, uh, with the, especially the set and lighting concepts and stuff like that and what we were going for. And, uh, that really made things a lot easier, um, for, me being, you know, a technical director, it was easier for me to communicate to my crew uh, what they needed to accomplish. But also with the producer of the show, um, the ideas that I had, I was able to, you know, make sure that they were fitting in with the vision that they had for the show. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't um, anything, you know, really groundbreaking that we were doing. And, you know, it was actually quite modest, to be honest. But it was... Um, a much better experience, you know, that second time around, just being able to be more uh, in depth uh, in the beginning. And, uh, you know, that definitely helped me with uh, shows we had later on in the year, you know, Christmas productions and things like that. And it um, had me thinking about things, which led me to be a little bit more creative when it came to the sound design and stuff like that. And, you know, incorporating, you know, different special effects and stuff like that, that kind of added a, a different dimension to the show that I definitely wouldn't have thought of or had the time to produce, you know, had I come in later in the game, like, you know, I had before in, in previous attempts. Nice. And uh, something you said there a little bit ago um, about really just being a provider or an operator. That's the situation that I'm in when I do stuff for high school or community theater. You know, I get there for like a Sunday afternoon load in, I get a couple of days of tech rehearsal, a dress rehearsal, and then boom, they open. Um, so it's not a lot of time to get stuff together, and I quite often don't have any time to even so much as read a script or have any meetings beforehand. Um, but what's s served me really well is to have this this concept in mind, and I don't sit down and um, you know come up with the three paragraphs for a particular show, but I do it on a, a character by character level, or I want to mix in a band, even an instrument by instrument level. Um, it's maybe a little easier to understand if you think about characters on a stage in a, a musical or a play. Um, you know, if you got this big beefy character, you know, six foot tall and all muscles and stuff, you might think, oh, like, well, this is a really burly guy. I'll, I'll beef up the lows and and make him sound as manly as I can. Or to go a little step further, if he's if he's a character that maybe seems really masculine and in charge, but he's really insecure and that's part of the plot line, maybe I would go even like to a comedic point beyond that and make his voice sound really wimpy. You know, like the uh, the example I go back to is like the Warner Brothers baby. If you ever watch these Warner Brothers cartoons. You know, you look inside the, the cradle or the stroller, and there's a little baby in there, and it might say, Goo Goo Gaga, or it might be like, hey, what are you looking at, bub? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can have a lot of fun with that. You can play it, you know, very true to life, like, okay, scrawny, thin, nerdy character. We thin his voice out, no lows, make it nasally, big, burly character, you know, big, booming, basso voice, or you can invert him go all kinds of different places, but even when I'm just an op, even when I'm just sort of serving the play, I'm trying to get in there mentally and figure out what I can do, basically just to do it the best I can, to, to not just provide sound, but to help further the telling of the story by what I'm doing and, and sculpt it and shape it a little bit. And if there's time, um, you know, I like to build my own sound effects and not just grab stuff off a of CD, or if I am grabbing stuff off a of CD... I try and put some depth to it and kind of layer things up and custom design a little bit. 
And uh, I know it's not done a ton, but I've even gone so far as to do more than just put a little reverb on vocals in the theater. Like, I've, I've done some crazy delays just here and there and had it work out really well. Um, yeah, it's, you know, the the one production we did, um, there were characters that uh, were, you know, like a lightning bolt. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Like, I don't know, a, a raindrop or something like that. And... Um, you know, usually, well, how it had been in time past, it it would have been, you know, that would have been like a, a, a set element. Those characters would have been like, you know, larger than life kind of things. And what we decided to do this time around was um, animate them where, you know, we had images of them. And then, you know, we had uh, our video guy, you know, animate them and, and make the lips move to go along, you know, with the with the words, you know, with their script and everything like that. And I was able to sit down with the script and like, okay, well, this is a, a lightning bolt and it's a female character and, you know, her name is Flashy or something like that. So it's like, all right, well, now it's like, okay, now we're having discussions of, you know, well, what what sort of attitude does this lightning bolt have? And, you know, what, you know, is she loud and boisterous or is she, you know, kind of timid or, or you know, whatever and being able to kind of develop um what those characters were like even though they weren't you know people and then that made it a lot easier when it came time to you know do the the overdubs for the voices that would go with the animation you know like all right well this you know telling the person doing the voice you know this is who uh this is who you are this is your attitude and you know um you should be oozing confidence or you should be timid or you know you should have a playful sound or whatever and then from there, I actually, you know, did stuff, you know, whether just a little bit of, you know, pitching the voices up or down, you know, it's really a lot of fun. It, it took a lot of time, but it really, um, I, I felt like it really helped sell the characters, you know, as opposed to just having a voice with, you know, a, a non-animated, you know, set piece, you know, we were actually to have, you know, basically a, an animated video on the screen to go along with it. And I thought it, it fit really well and it was worth the extra effort on it nice and uh while you were saying that i was thinking about uh we just had our first production movie meeting for the movie we're gonna make this year for this year's christmas production and what i've got to deal with is really just a very true to life thing like we're just we're looking at you know people just normal people doing normal things basically and there's you know some other things going on that make it kind of special but really it's just a real world sort of thing like i don't i don't have laser rifles or alien spaceships or anything like that to really get crazy with the sound design so if i'm gonna do some work as a sound designer and not just you know serve the the product by like okay well we're making a movie i'll go out and i'll i'll get the actors voices on set and i'll get some room tones and some outdoorsy sounds um where i'm having to go to actually do some work to support the story and, and help tell the story with my aspect of the project is um, looking at what those ordinary sounds are going to be and when there's something a little bit special going on um, cranking something up like this isn't what I'm going to use but like you know say whether you're outdoors in the backyard and you know it's just a regular old afternoon but then suddenly it pulls in tight and two family members are having a really intense moment um, something I might do is go into the background take a wind chime that was already there uh, and either on site or bring it back to the studio and get a really good sample of that wind chime and then fly it in, maybe put some spatial effects on it or sample it or resample it or do something to it, but take something out of it, out of the natural ambience and atmosphere and amplify it. Um, or in other cases, like another way you could go in a scene like that is start with the backgrounds maybe even a little not overtly but abnormally high you know so you hear the rushing and the cars going by and people are maybe talking a little loud to get over it and then when it comes down to that moment make it all go away except you know or to to a degree i guess you know you could either just take it down and have it be a subtle effect or have it suddenly just be two voices and you know that close-up shot of you know a parent and a child talking um and it really just kind of finding things to to work with, you know. It's sort of, it's almost like like found object artwork. Um, you know, it's it's a re it's going to be a real challenge to find stuff that I can create to put in there. I'm mostly going to be working with with what I can find as we're out and about doing things. And then to go in a completely different direction, if you're going to apply this m sort of method of thinking, you know, say, well, you know, I'm just I'm just a guy mixing in clubs. You know, how is that going to affect me? Um, 
it can really set you apart from the crowd in that you're probably already doing this anyway. And if you pay attention to it a little bit and sort of develop the, the skill, you know, you see a bunch of guys come in and they all got long hair and scraggly beards and they're wearing tie dye and baggy pants. Like, what do you think? I mean, oh, these guys are fish. They're a jam rock band or they're a deadhead band. Your brain automatically makes that jump to the type of drum sounds. So like you're probably going to turn the gates off and just let there be some bleed and guitars are, you're going to want to probably be kind of mellow, except, you know, maybe they're a little bit cutting. And if the band comes in with like bleached mohawks and studs and leather, you know, you're, you're dipping back into the, the eighties ethos of big metal sound. Or if, you know, they come in with safety pins everywhere, including through their noses, you know, you got a punk band on your hands and that that's going to inform the decisions you make. And that's, you're probably doing that unconsciously, but if you do it consciously, um, it allows you to take that extra step. You can go that extra mile and, and really drill in, and maybe you don't even do anything too specific. Like it might, depending on what you have at your disposal to do, it might be something similar. Like, all right, well, I'll just I'll shut the drum gates off, and and that'll make these guys a little bit different. Because probably what the music, you know, if you have a jam rock band and a wasp cover band on the same stage on the same night, they're going to do a fair amount to differentiate themselves from one another. But you know what you can do. Uh, you know, their fans will appreciate it because their band sounds more like something that, that they want. You you might actually win over some of the other part of the crowd by making it that much more inviting, making it that much different instead of just, you know, drum sound. It's the same drum sounds for five or six acts on a showcase night, and the guitars all pretty much sound like the same guitars. Yeah, um, definitely. No... Know, know what you're walking into, and if it's a situation where, you know, all right, well, it's it's going to be one night only with this band, you know, spend some time, you know, while you're micing the kid and they're loading in and all of that, you know, just don't be running wires and, and putting mics on stuff. Be talking with them about, you know, uh, what they're going for, you know. I mean, it it's, you know, easy if they if they stick to one thing, like, oh, well, we're a Metallica trippy band. All right, well, that's that's cool you know i i can make that happen or you know then it gets a little bit wider like well we we do all sorts of stuff from the 80s well then you you should probably know like all right well bon jovi had a little bit different sound than rat and rat had a little bit different sound than motley crew and motley crew had a different sound than you know twisted sister um and being able to emphasize that on a song by song basis is um you know it can be challenging on the fly, but it's, it's worth it. And, you know, always, always ask for, you know, a set list, especially when you're dealing with, um, you know, cover bands and stuff like that. They'll appreciate it because they're, they'll be able to tell right away that you, you're really interested in what they're doing. And, you know, so, you know, between the time doors open and the band starts, well, okay. You know, like, um, you know, from whom the, the bell tolls by Metallica, it's like, all right, well, uh, I know I'm going to need, you know, a delay set for the vocal on that or, um, you know, uh, they're going to do, you know, Hot for Teacher by, you know, Van Halen. Well, the drums are going to sound a lot different for that song than they would other ones. And uh, just being able to kind of have rough things on a song by song basis of what you need to emphasize or what you need to change to make that particular song sound more authentic um, then just kind of like, you know, your, your stock mix, I think can go a long way and, um, it'll be good because, you know, really the, the patrons at the show aren't going to be like, Oh, well, the song guys doing a really good job of making them sound just like Aerosmith. It's like, Oh wow, this band is awesome. They sound just like Aerosmith. And it's like, you know, it's hopefully cause the band's playing the song the right way, but also because you're, you're nailing kind of those sonic signatures that come with the songs. And for me, that's been a lot of times vocal effects because the band in a lot of cases, you know, if, if they're going to be covering 80s metal, the drummer's not showing up with a trap kit with, you know, an 18 inch kick and, you know, this little suitcase kit. He's probably got like great big double kicks and, a you know, a great big boomy snare and huge toms. And the guitar players are probably playing half stacks and they've got pedals or processors to sort of sculpt their own sound. But the singer's really out there on his own. So... If you kind of have that that catalog in your head of what things should sound like, you can hand them the right mic at the beginning of the set, and then go back and you know work your your reverbs and your, your delays. I mean, even if you don't hit it ex you know, exactly on, I mean, I'm, we're talking about a, a genre that I'm a fan of, and that I've done a bunch of mixing for cover bands that do that same stuff. So like, I've got this catalog in my mind of like, all right, well, you know, they just went from a Van Halen song to where 
uh, you know, how they're going to do a Billy Idol tune. Like the the delay settings that I'm mm-hmm. going to use are distinctly different for both of those, and that's that's really about all I do for these guys. Like the guitar players are stepping on different patches and and making that signature sound happen and the the drummers to an extent are are doing their thing to play in the style of you know a tommy lee or an al van halen or you know whoever it is that they're trying to emulate and the singer shaping their voice but there's also a lot of production that goes into that vocal that signature vocal sound and, and it's it can be as simple as just switching from a reverb to a delay and tapping in the right delay and uh you know hitting those echoes and mm-hmm. and making that come alive and i've I've gotten a few compliments from that, even if it's just from another singer that was in the room. It's like, hey, you get this. This is really making it tonight. You know, it's that extra little kick in the butt that kind of gets things going. Yeah. And, you know, in, the, in those situations, they're, they're playing songs that everybody knows. And all of those songs have some sort of signature, you know, whether it's, um, I don't know, like, how fast he's playing the hi-hats on Run to the Hills. You know, it's like, all right, we'll give the hat mic. A little bit more of a bump because you know that that's all over that track or um you know like revert i can't remember what cruise song i'm gonna say wild side maybe there's like a reverse oh, yeah. gated reverb it's like if you have that use it you know it just it helps sell it so much better and um you know really it it, it speaks volumes for your uh, attention to detail and you know just wanting to go the extra mile behind the console. Um, you know, I love hearing that, you know, when I'm, when I'm out seeing a band or something like that, you know, if it's just, uh, like, um, you know, you're at some street festival and it's just the local provider, just, all right, everything's gained at unity. Good luck. You know, it's like, Oh, all right. Thanks. You know, but, um, really mixing it, you know, that's, that's what gets you callbacks for, you know, more gigs down the line. And it's not hard to do. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been to a club and, like, you hear about it written in magazines, too, about that guy that, you know, comes up, does your sound check, and then by the middle of the first song, he's out in the alley having a cigarette or he's over at the bar, you know, schmoozing with the waitress or whatever. I mean, just paying the least bit of attention to what you're doing really, <laughs> you're all, just doing that gets you head and shoulders above a lot of guys in this business. And um, just... Uh, Sorry, I'm stumbling here. The uh, having the the whole uh, just a conceptual idea, even if it's not a formal process. I mean, I've already said this a couple of times. I guess I'm just going to reiterate it. But thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing and what it's going to mean to the people that are hearing it. Um, you know, like I mentioned a jam rock band a few minutes ago. Like I hardly listen to any of that stuff. I mean, I know roughly what a Fish record sounds like and what the Dead sound like and what they sound like live. You know, from recordings, but. Uh, you know, as simple a thing as, you know, a lot of these bands that I've mixed more like have done their own sound and they run into me at a festival stage or something. And I just put in like a little slap back, you know, Buddy Holly style delay on the lead vocal. And it makes it just that touch different from, you know, if it's a jam rock stage at, at some hippie fest, you know, it make, it sets them apart from the next one and the one that went before them and the one that, you know, all day long, if, if people are hearing a clean vocal, if the guys that I'm mixing for are you know have that little bit to set them apart there's this space to it and there's something that just sounds a little more polished and a little more professional so um a lot of times it doesn't take a lot of thought and but the the better you get at it the more you find yourself doing it all the time and thinking about it on every input and on every project no matter what you're working on and it it really transfers easily like i like i was saying earlier you know i learned it in a visual context for you know light and set and costume and paint design you know, in that type of structure, and it transferred just instantly to the, the the world of sound and every aspect of the world of sound, whether it's sitting down with a band to talk about a recording beforehand or, um, you know, meeting a band for the first time. And actually, it, um, I've been talking for a while here, but um, before I hand it over again, uh, one thing that Carl was saying about getting to know a band if you're meeting them, you know, on a, a quick fire quick change up scenario um the quickest way to get to the bottom of things is like all right you know if you can only ask if you only have half a minute with one guy from the band just ask him you know who do you like i mean Mm -hmm. even if they're not you know even if they're playing original material you know like if they you know if all he says well you know radiohead's my favorite band okay that immediately gives you at least something for a frame of reference like you know right away the sort of direction you should head and it might take a couple of songs before you sort of catch their exact vibe but um 
just simple, simple, uh, you know, a short little mental process like that can put you right in the groove towards having a good performance. Yeah, it's, um, you know, if you don't know, ask. Like, I got thrown into a situation where it was um, Eastern Indian music, sitars, and these really cool but really unique per hand percussion instruments. I had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't know where the sound came out of these instruments, let alone, you know, how this music is supposed to work together. So, you know, it was, all right, find the leader of the group. Hey, um, I, I don't know much about this, but I, I want to represent your music the right way. So, you know, what what's the main instrument? What what carries it here? You know, which drum really carries the rhythm and, um, you know, which other stringed instruments really uh, lay down, you know, what the melody is and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, um, I think for the most part, all instrumental music. So it was, you know, really important to know, all right, well, what instrument really sets the tone for these songs, you know, and it was, uh, it was worthwhile asking those questions and it was a, a five minute conversation and, you know, it, it really helped me. And, you know, I, uh, I think I, you know, gained the trust of the people playing, you know, before we even turned anything on. And, you know, it's just if you don't know, ask and it'll help you out big time. Yeah, that can be the difference between working together and fighting each other throughout a whole set. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of bands have been really burnt by that uncaring sound guy uh, to the point where we're kind of almost represented by those guys, unfortunately. And sometimes it can really be work uh you know, to beat that hurdle to convince a band that you're you're not just here to make your 10 bucks an hour and go smoke your cigarette you're here to to you know help them create some art you know something that's hopefully going to be unique and interesting and and only happen this way this exact way this one time for these people and uh it's oftentimes after a, a long day of you know probably a day job and a load in in a lot of people's situations to come up with that enthusiasm um, and so having some stock questions to ask in your pocket can go a long, long way towards, uh, towards making that connection and having a good night. Got anything to add? Or? Um, I guess a step further, you know, if you're working with one particular band all the time, you know, just, um, not only know the new, the nuances of their songs, but also, um, you know, when appropriate add signatures of your own. Um, you know, when I was out with, um, catch, there were certain parts of certain songs where, um, the singer started to expect me to do long delays on certain lines of lyrics. And, uh, you know, there, there'd be a lot of times where he'd, he'd stand on the edge of the stage so he could hear the PA better <laughs> to hear me do it. And, you know, I remember a couple times where, you know, we were, you know, at a venue, you know, where it was like, well, I didn't have a delay that day. I only had one reverb or something like that. And mm -hmm. I couldn't do it, you know, and, and he'd, he'd go out there and, and listen for it. And then he'd look right at me like, you know, what the hell is Carl doing? Why, <laughs> why didn't I hear that delay? And it's like, you know, is he not at the desk? And it's like, I was at the desk. I just couldn't do it, you know? And those are always funny conversations to have after a show. Um, but you know, it, that, that's just a lot of fun and it keeps it fresh for you, you know, behind the console, being able to play around with stuff like that and, and see what they like and what they don't like. And, you know, after you have that relationship and that trust, you know, you'll, you'll have that communication like, all right, you know, the delay stuff is cool on the vocal, but I, I don't, I don't think it really fits that song, you know, and the, you know, the singer would tell that to me, you know, and it's just like, or he'll have an idea like, well, what about doing it, you know, at this part of this song and just different things like that. And it, it was something that, um, you know, it, it was good to know. Cool. Well, uh, I've been liking the discussions we've been having lately. I know for a pro audio blog, people uh, probably expect us to be talking about gear a whole lot. And I think actually the next time we get the whole round table together again, which I might possibly be next week. I don't know. I'll have to see. Um, we're probably going to delve into it again. Um, Gear Chaos 2012. <laughs> so a lot of us guys work live and record live or record in the studio or, you know, it's just we, we go in a lot of different directions uh, in our different pursuits. So we do have some gear we can talk about, and uh, it might be something a little bit different from what you hear on or see on the uh, 
on all the big boy magazines because most of us don't have the opportunity to play with uh, the kind of stratospheric budgets that that get you the, some of the things that they're reviewing. We're a lot of us using a lot more down to earth kind of stuff. Like I get to mix on a Midas every week, but you know, there's also some Behringer stuff hiding here and there, and some beat up Prezonus and DBX stuff. So anyway, just as a point of illustration, we'll be talking about that stuff. Um, we've also got coming up. I could not. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this on. Uh, in a, it was either at a podcast or might have been before one. So. The listening public might not have heard of this, but a friend of ours uh, from SUNY Purchase um, has gone on, has a, a musical career going, has a couple wildly different records out. Um, I heard my first recording of an industrial act that included ukulele when <laughs> I was checking out her stuff. Um, but she was somebody that came from the same production background that I did and took it in an entirely musical direction. But, uh, you know, the the learning that she did about you know the mechanics and the the art of producing music and records uh went into you know her how she made her records so i was hoping to get her on a podcast um she would only agree to do an email interview so that'll be getting posted up soon and you know if there's a maybe a wave of good response <clears throat> hit the comment section uh we'll be able to get her on to have a discussion with i also got um a good friend of mine that i toured with and has played bass for years and also done some uh live mixing and recording work uh, my buddy Chip is back in town and close enough for me to hopefully get up here on a microphone one night. So we are going to keep uh, periodically dipping back into the whole uh, musical side of things and how tech influenced music. And we, we already sort of covered how music influences tech. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that's interesting to us. There's there's a million places you can go to read about gear and see guys talking about gear. And, you know, we've all got gear. But uh, I, the stuff that's interesting to us is, is the philosophy and the the concept like we just talked about tonight so be looking for that in the near future and uh, also proud to say uh, one more week uh, next week will be our 10th podcast which is uh, i knew i was setting us a pretty ambitious goal to uh, to get one of these up every week and it, sometimes we've been ahead uh, but it, it's not always easy to get it done so i don't know it's been exhausting <sighs> I'm spent, but yeah, I've just I I keep bracing myself for that week when i'm gonna have to sit in this chair and hang my head and type sorry guys no podcast this week um but also i want to i want to put that on the listeners um if you think you've got something to contribute even just the least little bit to contribute or if you live in the neighborhood and you just want to hang out um or if you don't live in the neighborhood and you'd, you'd like to just uh turn skype on so you can kind of hang out and I don't know, maybe contribute a text message or something we'd we'd love to have you love to have you participate love to get different viewpoints in there that was the whole reason we got this thing going was to exchange ideas and and get thoughts provoked i guess so, um, we're a little over here, although I've got some editing to do. I don't know if this is going to wind up longer or shorter than normal. It's definitely going to be strange, though, a bit of a patchwork. So, this is your host, John Dayton, with special guest, Carl Maciag. And we'll be signing off for this week, and that's a wrap.